challenges with this presentation. So in the last hour, um, this is actually a presentation that I haven't even really rehearsed because in the last hour it's, um, it's been cut in half because as I watched the afternoon go by and, and remember when I was a student, um, knowing that I'm the last speaker of the day, uh, you know, I thought, yeah, this is probably something about a long presentation that's just really not going to go well on a nice sunny afternoon. <clears throat> um, so here we are, and then and then we didn't have notes, and so I was going to have to sit without notes, and now we're back with notes, so uh, it's been a nice roller coaster. I'm Sherwood Wilson, I'm the Vice President for Administration here at Virginia Tech. Um, and among other things, many other things, I'm responsible for all of the built environment um, that is Virginia Tech. Today I'm going to talk to you about construction from an owner's perspective. We've heard from some of the leading industry experts um, about construction from the CM and the general contractor's perspective. And today I think it's important to understand that for every CM or, or GC, there's an owner out there someplace. So what makes us different from any other commercial hospital or industrial owner? We're going to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities that, that make us a little unique. We'll talk about the changing environment, which is probably the most important thing I'll talk about today. And then we'll do a little sneak preview uh, of some exciting things that are coming up in the future. Every construction project has its challenges. I've, I've never been on one that didn't. Can't hear back there? Do we have a volume? How's that? Is that better? Okay. I've never been on a construction project that didn't have its challenges. The thing that's unique about higher education is that we're unique, and so therefore we have a unique set of challenges. Some of those are imposed on us, and some are self-imposed. Sometimes that's a problem, and sometimes it's not. One of the challenges uh, is that we're accountable to a lot of people. Because we're a, a state agency, a public body, we're accountable to the public trust. We have about 230,000 living alums. Some are right here in the room. Those alums have a legacy that's part of Virginia Tech, part of, of what made Virginia Tech, part of what built us. And so we, we have an obligation of accountability to, to the legacy of those alums, to the citizens of the Commonwealth, and in fact, to the world in the, in the United States, the public trust. And then of course, students and parents. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for our students and parents. We have about 25,000 students apply to be Hokies every year. And we bring in a freshman class of about 6,000. And so that's a small percentage of folks who want to be here. Why do they want to be here? They want to be here because of brand reputation, who we are. It took a long time for Virginia Tech to build that brand that hokey nation, that feeling of being here like no place else in the world. We have accountability to government, certainly. We're a, we're a state agency. We're tax supported. We're supported by federal grants, federal research, federal financial aid. And so accountability is a big part of who we are. One of the most important things, though, we need to understand about higher education is that we live in a different time frame than the rest of society. We think in terms of centuries, not decades. Oxford, University of Bologna, they're almost a thousand years old, and they exist today. Harvard, 1836, almost 400 years old. And while we're a 
lot younger. Virginia Tech, founded in 1872. We've been here almost 150 years. And you know what? We'll be here 150 years more. And 150 years after that. Because in higher education, that's what we do. And as our, as our contractors, our CMs, we have to understand that we think in terms of building life cycles as 100 or 150 years, not 30 to 50 like we do in commercial construction typically. So it requires a different mindset. It requires very deliberate, thoughtful planning about what the campus looks like in the future. We have design standards. Some of these, again, are imposed on us. Some are self-imposed. In 2010, under the able and stellar leadership of then um, the, the chairman of my committee, John Lawson, the board passed a resolution that requires any building in the core academic core campus, which basically is defined as uh, Price's Fork Road, Washington Street, West Campus Drive, and, and Main Street, must be designed in collegiate, with collegiate Gothic architecture, and it must be clad primarily in Hokie Stone. That's an example of a design standard that was imposed on us. by our board. We also have internal, have internal design standards that look at things like the quality of materials, building density, in other words, the green ratio, how much green space do we have to build space, the interstitial spaces between buildings, places where students can have collective, productive collisions after class, before class, to and from class, Places where bright ideas can happen and take place. Those have to be thoughtfully planned and designed. And our design standards require that we do that. Uh, pedestrian and traffic buildings. Parking issues. How many of you students, if you had to list one of the worst things about campus, would say parking? Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's a huge, important aspect of the campus. And so that's something that's built into our design standards that we look at that. And of course, of course, life cycle costs. Sometimes it's so easy to, to weigh first cost of construction against life cycle costs. And so we pick the easy one. We pick the cheapest first cost because money is tight. But in the end, the life cycle cost of the building is significantly greater. And that just creates problems for us down the road. Again, remember, we don't think in terms of decades. We think, we think in terms of centuries for a campus. So while design standards, they might constrain us, in other ways, they make sure we stay true to who we are. They help us create that sense of place that is Virginia Tech that feeling of being part of the Hokie Nation, that feeling of Hokie Stone walls, Hokie Stone buildings, of the drill field. You know, recruiting, of course, is a big part of, big reason, part of the reason why we have 25,000 applicants to come here every year. And the students are admitted and ultimately come to Virginia Tech the vast majority of them say one of the primary reasons they came to Virginia Tech was for the aesthetic view of the campus, because of the way the campus looks. That's who we are. That's what we call the sense of place that we work so hard to create. And so while design standards and policies and procedures and Accountability to multiple owners might be cumbersome and challenging for both us and our CM partners. They, they serve a really crucial purpose. They keep us focused 
on who we are and why we're here. Sometimes we lose our sense of place. During the 70s, and we were, some of us grew up in the 70s, and, and uh, you know, there were some pretty good times in the 60s and 70s, but architecture wasn't one of the good things about the 70s, and you know, I suppose leisure suits weren't either, but uh, you know, Virginia Tech lost its way a little bit in terms of who we are and that sense of place that we are with buildings like Whittemore and Daring. That effect. If you saw these pictures, unrelated to Virginia Tech, you'd have no idea you were on our campus. And, and that's what design standards, whether imposed by the board or internally imposed, that's what design standards help us do. They help us maintain that sense of place, that sense of being a hoagie of, of who we are and what we're all about. So compliance, we talked about compliance a little bit. This is a challenge and an opportunity. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we're no different from any municipality out there. We have our own building code official. We have our own stormwater and erosion setup control office. And they do everything a municipality does. The difference is, the difference is and Rick Henson, our building official, is sitting right back there. The difference is, Rick's focus is on the building code. But it's how to use the building code to make better buildings for Virginia Tech. Most municipal building code officials have one allegiance and one allegiance on them, and that's to the code itself, the black and white word of the code. But the part of the code, the reason building officials have uh, latitude to interpret the code is to use their head, use their common sense. And so in this case, it, Rick's job is to interpret and enforce the building code, but at the same time, He's looking out for Virginia Tech's interest in doing that. So as we said this morning, um, our code office was established in 2011. And um, prior to that, the state building official did our inspections on the campus. We do on average now 42 times more inspections than the state building official did. Is that a hindrance for our CMs and our GCs? It can be, but all Rick's job, the building official job, is just to ensure compliance with the drawings and specs that were written compliant with the code. And so in the end, we get a better product, we the owner, you as the CMs give better communication with the owner because we're there every day. There are no surprises. There are no, you know, you've got 150 feet of wall ready to cover up. And after a week's work, you find out that it's all got to come back down because something's wrong. We have the cost of communication. And of course, we, unlike a lot of folks, have a lot of federal and state compliance agencies that we have to deal with because of our research and so forth. Now let's talk about the change in environment. This is one of, if you don't take anything away from my presentation today, understand that the environment in higher education is changing and it's changing dramatically for many, many reasons. We talked a little bit about this this morning. Too. This graph illustrates our capital construction expenditures since 1990, between 1990 and 2015. If you see the first three quarters of the graph, it basically follows the rate of inflation, about 3% a year, until the last decade. In the last decade, our capital construction expenditures, or over that 25 year period, have increased 900%. That's a lot of growth. 
but it's happened in the last decade. Because Virginia Tech is a changing institution. Because our place in the world is evolving. Our place in higher education is evolving. And we're becoming an international research university. So how do we pay for all that? Well, it used to be really simple. Our construction used to be paid for either with state capital dollars that were allocated on a biennial basis, or they were paid for from student fees, auxiliaries, you know, buying, dorm, parking, and so forth. It was pretty basic, pretty simple. Well, we have a new pair paradigm today because of split funding years and one-size-fits-all formulas from the state. Our resources for capital projects from the state are dwindling every year. Projects take significantly longer now because funds are allocated in three separate biennia for the different phases of construction. Most every project we do now has a, has a funding component other than state money. It may be private, it may be local, it may be research, but that's a funding shift or a paradigm shift in how we do projects and how we pay for them. It's made, it's made development activities and, and fundraising much, much more important. It takes much longer from inception of a project to completion. Um, and it's made us look at some different kind of models of procurement, like the PPEA and, and others. And so this new paradigm of funding and how we fund project, projects is a significant challenge and a significant change in culture, change in how we do business. We've talked about sustainability already. It's another great example of a culture that's, that's changing rapidly, quickly, when I came to Virginia Tech in 2007, we didn't even have a sustainability office. Nothing. Um, in 2009, because students were demanding that the university change and become more, become more sustainable, uh, we created what we called the Climate Action Commitment that was specific to Virginia Tech. And it was approved by the board in 2009 by then rector, I believe, John Lawson. One of the things that it does is it requires every building on campus be designed to at least lead silver standards. And I'm proud to say since 2009, we've done three lead gold buildings, we've done four lead silver buildings, and one lead certified building. And we have eight more lead buildings in design, some fashion of design right now, including one that we're designing to lead planning. But of course, April 16, 2007, this of all places understands the changes that happened here. But April 16th didn't just change Virginia Tech. It changed our industry. All of higher education changed on April 16th, 2007. In many, many, many ways. But from the perspective of this conference, safety and security measures in buildings became paramount. Things like security cameras. We now require every new building we build to have security cameras, outside and inside, in the non-public areas or in the non-private areas. Uh, we have an emergency notification system that's pre-wired into every building. We have a distributed antenna system so that first responders, when you come in a Hutchinson building, if you're working on a radio, as a first responder would be, you have no communication. So you're, if you're a first responder and you're in one of our buildings, you can't communicate. So all of our new buildings have distributed antenna systems on them so that first responders can communicate. Every classroom door, every office door is lockable now. 
The list goes on and on and on, but just important to understand that any of you who are doing work in the higher education sector, safety and, secu safety and security used to be a Passover issue when it came to construction on campus. It no longer is that. It's a huge, important issue. And every project you do on a campus or university will incorporate many safety and security functions. And just like the culture changing today is one of the most important takeaways you should have from this, this slide is also a flexible design. Designs have to be flexible today. For our buildings, today and tomorrow, in the 100 years, we have to have flexible floor plates, larger deck fans, materials have to be flexible and reconfigurable, and your, the MEP systems have to be flexible enough to be reconfigured and re-reconfigured and re-re-reconfigured. The classroom building right here next door is a great example of, of a building that we're doing with W and Jordan that is hugely flexible in design. There's not a single lecture-style classroom in that building. It's all open space and reconfigured. There's not a single lecture point for a professor lectures. There's not a single fixed screen or a single fixed projector from where to project. It's wired so that a student plugs their computer in at their seat and it can be shown on any, any monitor in the space. And the rooms can be divided into small rooms or large rooms. That was, it was designed from the get-go with that in mind. So what happens when you don't design buildings flexibly in today's world? We have Brody, Rash, Thomas, Monty, and the middle part of Davidson Hall, all within the last, well, in the, we're in the process of being raised right now. Within the next three years, those five buildings will cease to exist. Why? Because when they were built, the design was so rigid that it couldn't possibly be used for anything beyond what it was designed to do a hundred years ago in some cases. And we can't have that. We have to build buildings in the future like the classroom building. So it could be a classroom building tomorrow, and in 10 years it could be a lab building, and in 10 years after that it could be offices. And in 10 years after that, it could be, who knows, what the teaching technology will require at that point, or the research technology. And campus is a living lab. This is a this is a pet thing of mine. I've been in higher education for 35 years, and, and I think every place on campus, everywhere should be a classroom. Our buildings, our turf, our sidewalks, our streets and pavement, even the power plant, they all have to be living labs, but we have to take advantage of those living laboratories. Goodwin Hall, the signature engineer building, right over here in the parking lot, just opened up uh, last year. It's our, it's our first, finest and newest example of what a living laboratory is, it, it should be. It's, it truly is a groundbreaking experiment in what you can do with a sensor building to detect, detect even the smallest vibrations in the building or the surrounding areas. This year, Goodwill Hall, I'm told, don't quote me on this, I'm told this year Goodwill Hall will be the most instrumented public building in the world. Uh, with 240 accelerometers um, attached to the building throughout the ceilings and the floors, that will detect information on occupants within the structure and the load of the occupants, a 
things like structural settling, wind loads, and movement resulting from, air, uh, from earthquakes. And outside the building, there's a sensor array that will measure external vibrations like wind, traffic, and even the roar from Keaton Stadium when the Hokies score a touchdown. That's how sensitive this is. And so there's already research, a lot of research going on in, in Goodwill Hall that uses these built-in sensors and accelerometers that are part of the design process. Another building, our next living lab, uh, if and when it comes to fruition, uh, is currently in design. Our multimodal transit facility, which will be located, uh, you'll see a better picture over here in a few minutes, uh, just right across the street. It's a collaborative effort between the town of Blacksburg and the Federal Department of Transportation to create, to replace, it actually replaces the bus uh, transit hub that the drill field serves right now. But it will be um, a showcase, a sustainability showcase, where classes can come and learn about sustainability efforts. Uh, some of the things that we're considering for the design, this is the one I said, uh, is the platinum, or we're designing for the platinum. So we'll have a vegetative green roof, photovoltaic panels in the bus canopies, a cistern to collect rainwater for non potable water in the building, vertical wind turbines. Um, and part of the project is, is we're trying to daylight Scrubles Creek so that it only not be, it not only becomes an aesthetic feature for the campus, but becomes a classroom and lab of a living, live, endangered water source through the middle of campus. So it's a, it's a great opportunity. So now let's get to the fun stuff. We're going to look forward um, just for a glimpse of, of, of what we see in the future. We've heard today from truly some of the brightest, most experienced industry leaders in construction. As students, what you should take away from this is that there are career opportunities that the education that this program brings you that can lead you any place. Not just in the construction industry, but as an owner. And you have opportunities with things like the building construction program, and now you have miners and real estate and business that opens the whole world up to you. And so I hope that you'll, what you'll take away from today is that while I can't speak from a contractor's perspective, you shouldn't limit your horizons in the world because it's wide open and you have a whole career field in front of you. So with that, let's take a sneak peek at some of the upcoming changes uh, that we're planning on the campus um, in the near future. So first we'll start uh, on the upper quad, uh, so this is alumni mall. Um, this is um, Rash and Brody. Rash has already been raised, and Brody, when you drive by the, the mall, you can see it is already up and under roof. Uh, Precast is on it, and Hokey Stone is is started uh, to go up. This building finishes this fall, uh, and immediately this building, the replacement of Brody, begins, and it will be finished next fall. So we have 537 beds uh, being done in 12 months. That's a pretty aggressive schedule. Um, as part of this upper quad, as I said earlier, Thomas and Monteith get raised and are not immediately reported <coughs> by anything. Um, we'll hold that as open green space uh, in future development. The core leadership and military science building, uh, it, it replaces the old print shop or mechanical arch building that's at the back of the quad. 
and lane right here in the center will stay. Um, and, and lane, by the way, was just listed on the National Historic Register uh, just this in 2014. This is what, um, two years from now, this is what the upper quad will look like. We're coming back to our collegiate Gothic roots. The upper quad, instead of being red brick, will be collegiate Gothic coaching stone buildings. Again, creating that sense of place, ensuring that who we are continues on into the future. Uh, this is what we call the North Precinct. It's actually kind of where we're sitting and behind in the old, what we used to call the B lot parking lot. Uh, we are currently sitting right here in Bishop Fabro. The, the construction that's happening right out our window is the classroom building um, that's scheduled to be finished in about 18 months, I believe, John, in that right? Time for school to start. The next priority in our capital plan will be a building right here beside Bishop Fabro, which will be a teaching laboratory building. Of course, this is Signature Engineering, or Goodwin Hall, and the parking garage. One, one of the ideas of the plan is to rebrand this edge of campus. Right now, when you come in through Park Price's Fork, what do you see? You see Whittemore, and you see Dairy Hall. And that's not what we want. And so, this gives us an opportunity to rebrand the campus edge with new buildings, that are for future growth. Perry Street as part of the Mulder Motor Project ceases to be a throughway. Uh, this will become a pedestrian way in the center part of Perry Street. The new multimodal transportation facility will sit directly in front of the parking garage. Again, that's in design right now. Um, and as, a, as I said earlier, it's a joint project with the town of Blacksburg and, and the um, uh, National Transportation, Federal Transportation folks. So there'll be a building here that'll house, uh, it'll be a, a big open, heated and cooled space for students to wait. There'll be DP offices there, there'll be a night hub there. Um, Everything that is intended to assist the bus riders through them will, this side has like eight canopies or ten, and this side has eight or ten canopies. So instead of students now, the buses, we have 18 or 20 buses that park around the drill field at different places as the transfer hub. Uh, now the students will come to one single location as a transfer for the, a transfer for the bus hub. And then on either end of that, to round it out, there'll be a, a roundabout right here on Stanger Street where it enters into Old Turner and what used to be Perry. And on the west side, there'll be a connector to the western, new western perimeter road that'll open up the western side of campus that you'll see in a minute. And just a, a little teaser for what this uh, may look like when it's finished. Better to stand out in front of hers with um, no cover. Uh, so, next we'll look at the drill field. You know, the drill field is, is one of the most iconic spaces we have on campus. Uh, talk about a sense of place. If you talk to alums, uh, one of the things that they always talk about first is walking across the muddy drill field when it's with the snow blowing so hard you can't see. Now, why that's one thing the alums would remember, I don't know, but they seem to kind of like that idea of walking across the drill field. Well, it's, it's an iconic space and it's unique to Virginia Tech. But 
it gets kind of run down because it gets used so much. It's the playground for the whole campus. And so, what are some of the things that we can do to maintain the iconic nature of the drill field and yet enhance its durability and its beauty? So one of the things we're looking at is modifying the edge parking. Right now, all the parking is on the drill field side. So when you're driving around the drill field, instead of looking at a nice green vista, what are you looking at? You're looking at windshields. And so we're going to flip the parking to the outside, closer to the buildings, so people aren't walking across the street. And so when you drive around the drill field, you have the, the green vista to look at as you go around. Upgraded pedestrian paths. We, we right now have a multiple disciplinary committee of researchers from four different colleges working with us to design or create a new material or a new substance that we can use for our paths across the drill field that are more than just paved cow paths. We want something that's aesthetically pleasing but yet durable enough that we can that can take the tens of thousands of feet crossing the drill field every day and at the same time be durable enough to be able to plow snow on them. Upgraded field turn. If you've seen the drill field in the middle of the summertime, particularly on a dry summer, it's as brown as a hay field. That's not what we want our iconic drill field to look like. So what we plan to do is upgrade the field turf in it, irrigate it so it's a green, lush lawn for <coughs> students to play in and the band to practice in and to have tag football games all season long. And upgrade the landscaping around the edges so that A, we can direct pedestrian traffic in the direction they, we want them to go, and B, again, to create that aesthetic appeal that green vista that is the drill field. And so one of the one of the big focus features of this are the are the trailheads. Um, this would be where the paths enter and exit the drill field. So it'll create a much larger space, a much safer crosswalk for the students, and it provides a path pathway into the drill fields, into the areas where the new new paths or crossings will be. It'll be what better better lighted. Um, it'll be uh, uh, so it'll have site amenities and in areas around the drill field. We plan to have areas where students can have some of those productive collisions, where uh, we'll have an area where they can sit and have Wi-Fi and electricity to plug in their computers and so forth. So things can happen in these interstitial kind of spaces. And then coming this summer, um, we'll have a project. You know, about four years ago, I was sitting uh, at the stop sign right there. And I was thinking to myself, why can't we turn left here? Because I wanted to go to the bookstore, and I didn't want to drive all the way around the mural field because it didn't make sense. And so I said to myself, why can't we turn left here? Now this is my second time in tech. So at some point in time between 89 and 95, I asked the question then too, and the reason was because there's no way to make a left-hand turn there. Well, I came back this time as vice president. And so my questions carry a little more weight now. <laughs> and so four years ago, I was sitting right there and I thought, I'm going to get an answer to that question. So I asked our university architect, why can't we turn left at the drill field? We're smart people. Surely we can figure out a way to do that. And sure enough, they did. So we're just going to reshape these islands that are on both sides of the drill field so that they're make they're not make sure, so that they're they serve the same purpose as a roundabout. And it lets us take traffic from Spanier Street, it would come around the loop two-way traffic in front of the mall, come back around the loop, and move right out there to Washington Street. And the same way coming this way. That reduces so much traffic on the drill field. It's so much safer. And then when we get the, the multimodal facility, 
built and we re relieve the drill field of all that bus congestion. Think how much safer and how much better aesthetics that's going to create around this iconic field. Uh, so just look at the, um, the science district now. This is what you students will lovingly call the cage lot, uh, or did it one time. Uh, this is the only building in the lot right now is having one, uh, of course, plus this chiller plant. But ultimately, as our research portfolio grows, and as money is available, um, the page lot will build out into a new precinct the science related, science and research related, that'll have the same kind of theme of a central green space, central pause, so that, again, these productive collisions can be created. There's room for expansion for that net, as well as other buildings over in the current science precinct. And there will also be a connection to the Western Perimeter Road from the end of Washington Street. And now this is the cool part. This is, and I'm, I'm really close to the end of this, I promise. So this is the area, this is current Southgate Drive. This is Route 460 coming from Christiansburg this way. The dairy science facility, the milking parlors here, the airport tech airport runs back this way. So this is the this is the current runway protection zone. So we've been working for about seven years on two massive, <coughs> massive projects that are funded both by Federal Department of Federal Department of Transportation and the, and the Federal Aviation Administration. One is to extend the runway at the airport so that larger corporate planes can land there. There's a lot of rumors that we're extending the runway so that the football field, the football players can take off and land from there. Not true. The Corporate Research Center in 25 years has built out. We have over 2,000 employees who work at the Corporate Research Center today. And we're recruiting mega companies who want to come here. Very frequently, very frequently, they say they won't come to Blacksburg because they can't land their corporate jet here. And they don't want to land in Rhino and drive to Blacksburg. So while there may be a lot of rumors about why we're doing this, the fact of the matter is we're extending the runway to 5,500 feet to make way for the future of Virginia Tech and the Corporate Research Center. At the same time, so that's what the expansion looks like. At the same time, many of us have worked tirelessly, both here and in Richmond, to create a new entrance into the south side of campus. Again, this is current South Gate Drive. So what will be happening literally within a month is construction will start on a new divergent diamond intersection or interchange that's about 1,900 feet south of the current Southgate Drive. And if you're familiar with where the, the, uh, 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 the bike path, the uh, uh, thank you, the Huckleberry crosses under 460, that's about where the new interchange will be. And, and it will come into a roundabout about where the silos were at the dairy barn. And you'll either turn right to go to the Corporate Research Center or stay straight and come to the Duck Pond Drive, which will be another uh, roundabout. The reason, one of the reasons we have to do this is because to extend the runway, this is the road that currently goes to the CRC. This is Research Center Drive. And the Huckleberry currently runs that same path. Well, the new runway takes that road out and takes out the Huckleberry. So the red line here is the new relocated Huckleberry. It will be all grade separated interchanges so you don't have any more bicycle, walker, pedestrian conflicts. It will all be grade separated. Um, and then um, this should be finished in 2018. Current Southgate will be regraded 
So that then when you come in from Virginia Tech, you'll have nice pastoral vistas that ultimately, in fact, I'll show you a video uh, in a minute. But this will create a, this will, this is a game changer, changer for Virginia Tech. It'll relieve traffic on Main Street, it'll relieve traffic on Crisis Fork Road, and it'll create a, a whole different paradigm as you enter Virginia Tech. And then it too will connect to the Western Front Road. In fact, this would be the beginning of the Western Front Road, and Prices Fort Drive would be the other end of the Western Front Road, as this slide. What this also does is it creates about 60 additional acres for growth of our research portfolio that currently didn't exist. So, again, in higher education, we think in terms of centuries, not decades. So 50 or 75 or 100 years from now, we still have space, we still have room to grow on the east side of 460. And then this is the western perimeter road, the proposed route right now, and just again to get you oriented, this is 460 coming from Christiansburg. The new interchange coming into this roundabout, and then uh, the Western Perimeter Road would just follow. It will essentially parallel 460 uh, in kind of a meandering, um, kind of a byway through the backside of campus that would connect here to Washington Street, would connect here to what would be Perry Street, would connect to the visitor center, and ultimately exit. Uh, at, the, at the light on Crisis Fork Road. The reason we need to do this is, is to reduce traffic congestion on campus. The idea is to get traffic from the center of campus to the outside of campus, away from the student, away from the pedestrian vehicle complex as soon as we can. And so this is what the new entrance to Virginia Tech could look like, or not could, will in fact look like coming off of 460. Uh, on the south side of campus. And this is a little, this is a model of what the divergent diamond interchange will look like. This is coming from Christiansburg. Uh, so traffic crisscrosses. Uh, so you have a, a hot right all the time without stops. It's like control. And then finally, uh, and in closing, uh, this is the view that you would have coming into Virginia Tech in the future. <clears throat> this is coming from, um, would be coming like from Prices Fork Road to the new interchange. Now you're kind of on campus, a new visitor sign. Coming up to that first roundabout where you would turn right to go to uh, the Cook Research Center and the airport. Or you would circle on around and come on to campus. Right now the car is traveling about where the dairy barn is. And it pops over the hill. Slow down, you're going to get a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> There's a new visitor center on the right, into that magnificent view of, of uh, Peden. We go around the roundabout and up the Pond Drive uh, as it currently exists. Thank you. All.